Did you start that Water for Climate page, or are you also just a part of it? I started it. Yeah. Started it two and a half months ago, and it's already 650 people. It's just really a thrill. Finding yeah. a lot, just people all over the world, literally, who are interested in it. Yeah. So let, so let me see. Um, it may be that it's already, <laughs> it may be that everybody can already see me and I'm just, uh, oh yeah, Hart Hagen is live now in water and climate. I'm here with Trevor Burian and I'm trying to deal with the technical stuff here. Uh, let's see, but I also want to see Trevor while we talk. So let me see. Your meeting is being live streamed. Okay. And I'm going to minimize this. And okay. So let's, and I'm going to what if I push play on that. So, and welcome to uh, the climate report, water and climate, and let's say soil for climate also. Well, welcome to all of those. I'm here with Trevor Burian, and we're going to talk about uh, Trevor's ranch in uh, Manning, North Dakota. So Trevor, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Hart. How are you? Doing great. So tell me about your operation and, and how did you get started? What mo motivates you to do it? And you know, do you say that you're like into regenerative agriculture, cattle, you're a rancher. So just tell me about yourself. Yeah, so uh, started ranching, or I was born and raised on the ranch I am now in uh, western North Dakota. We're about 45 miles northwest of Dickinson, North Dakota. Uh, yeah, born and raised here. Um, conventional farm, full tillage. Uh, ran cattle also, but kind of, uh, we did a little bit of rotations, but it, you know, there was, you know, definitely not probably proper rest and recovery, but uh, did a little bit of rotating just kind of when we ran out of grass or got real dry in one pasture, we'd move to a different one, but pretty conventional, conventional uh, farm. Um, I know my, like my dad struggled a lot, like, uh, you know, it was just tough times, drought years, and we're real dry out here in Western North Dakota. So yeah, that's how I grew up. So it was, it was pretty tough and he had some health problems. So um, I wasn't, when I was in high school, I told him I probably wasn't going to come back. And uh, so yeah, left, went to college, uh, bounced around, originally wanted to be a wildland firefighter. And then um, found myself working for the Forest Service back in Dickinson, fighting fire and ended up going to school here and then working on my buddy's ranch uh, as a side job and realized that I really missed it. And so that was probably in 2008. And then in the fall of 2009, uh, the people that were leasing my parents' ranch. The lease was up and I had an uncle that uh, had an opportunity for me to take on about 75 head of share cattle uh, came up. And so I decided to come back to the place and take on those share cattle. And that was in yeah, 2000, winter 2009, my first year back here. And uh, for a lot of years, or I guess until from 2010 to 2019, I, I ran the ranch pretty conventionally. Um, through my schooling, I, I heard of twice over grazing and uh, Dr. Robert Mansky a little bit. I tried to rotate, but I guess I learned what I was doing was uh, I was more, instead of rotationally grazing, I was more rotationally overgrazing. Uh, <laughs> just, just kind of as, you know, as soon as the grass would grow back, I'd just go in there and hammer it uh, because, you know, we were taught twice over grazing works, but, you know, I just, it was more just grazing, overgrazing twice uh, in a year. So not really doing that great. And uh, I sold a lot of hay off the place. We had some wet years. And so I made good money selling hay off the place. But then uh, in 2017, it started getting pretty dry. And the land just wouldn't grow any grass, especially where I hate. And I was exporting all that those nutrients for for those years and there was no litter left on the ground. I, I noticed plant spacing getting farther and farther apart. And I, so then I was like, well, I need to, I need to start busting this up and, and uh, reseeding it. And so I burned down or, or 
took Roundup to about 500 acres of hayland. And I, I started putting cover putting cover crops in. Now I now I learned uh, I probably would have been better off, been better off just leaving that in grass and uh, and running cattle and, and mob grazing it. But that's a decision I made, and I mistakenly poured a whole bunch of money and uh, to get into farming. And I tried putting fertilizer down on everything. And uh, 2017 was uh, like our like our ninth driest year on record since uh, the 1800 or late late 1800s. And uh, nothing, yeah, nothing grew and wasted probably about fifty thousand dollars on fertilizer trying to fertilize my hay fields and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that just does, that just doesn't work. So right. knew it wasn't working. And uh, so the winter of two thousand eighteen. 2018 was kind of another another little bit of a struggle. I was it went a little bit better than 17, but we got more rain. But winter 2018, I uh, well in 2018 I I tried a cover crop following winter rye, and both the winter rye and the cover crop did pretty well, and so I was excited about that, even though it was expensive. And so that winter I was on YouTube and I just typed in cover crops, and a Gabe Brown video came up and. I uh, yeah watched uh, watched that, learned that was real excited when I found out he was from, you know Bismarck, North Dakota, and gets only about a half inch to an inch more rain than me. So someone in a similar environment, and I just kind of uh, dove down the rabbit hole of watching every Gay Brown <laughs> talk there is on YouTube, and that brought me to Jim Garish and Burke Tiger and uh, Greg Judy, and uh, uh, Ray Archuleta, all those guys and. Yeah, it's been a it's been a real fun journey so far. I'm right. still uh, so I started. It, sound, it sounds like you kind of uh, one thing that happened to Gabe. It sounds like it might have been a little bit similar to you. You just kind of you you farm in the conventional way. You spend all this money on inputs. You don't have good results, and you end up having to buy, forcibly you you're forced into a corner, and you can't afford the inputs. So then yeah. you try to start looking around for a different way. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I just knew it wasn't, you know, I started putting all the fertilizer down and, and start farming because I saw that the farm was going backwards and I saw my neighbors putting all these other inputs down and I was like, okay, well, that's what I need to do. I need to start spending all this money. And that's, you know, obviously not what I should have did, but yeah, mm-hmm. so it kind of forced me into a, a area where I was searching for a, searching for a different way. Mm-hmm. So how, what did you do differently and how did you get different results when you started doing things differently? Um, I guess what I first started doing is uh, uh, just um, grazing my cows different. So I was, I kind of was at a, maybe a little bit of an advantage uh, starting out. I already was grazing with all my cows in one herd. Uh, so I didn't have multiple herds and we do have a bunch of smaller pastures already. We probably have nine or 10 smaller pastures um in like a three four mile square mile area um and so but so that was a little bit of advantage starting out and then each one of those pastures probably average around 160 acres and so i started busting those up uh at poly wire and doing two to three day moves to start out Mm -hmm. and uh i would make 30 acre paddocks and uh they, they were going through about 10 10 acres a day and, and, and doing it that way. And I, I, I could tell like immediately just doing the math of, okay, this is how much they're eating, you know, per day, each cow's consuming. I'm going through this many, many uh, acres a day. And I just did the calculating in it. And I was just blown away with how much grass, how long doing that was going to last me. Because every year before, by late July, I was out of grass. Hmm. I'd have to go haul all my hay off the hay fields, and then I'd graze the hay field regrow, which is terrible for that hay field. So that's great. You know, one thing that you want to do, if you can, is shorten that amount of time you have to give hay because, you know, hay costs something. So, and and you found, so you noticed immediately that with the rotational grazing, maybe you didn't do it exactly right or by the book or you know yeah sometimes you have to just do it and uh and then adjust but you saw results immediately and you were getting more uh productivity more uh you know the the same acreage 
was feeding your cows more immediately when you went to the rotational grazing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just just because I wasn't, uh, I was just allowing, you know, I was only on 30 acres at a time and just allowing the rest of the ranch to, to grow, especially early in our, our growing season. We produce like 80% of our forage between May 15th and July July 1st. And so just, you know, keeping the cows off, off that, I mean, or the rest of the acres, because it was all grazed down to nothing from the year before. So I wasn't starting in a, in a place where I had some residual where I was trying to stay ahead of the grass. I was trying to let the grass get ahead of me and, and get some tonnage out there. And yeah, just doing that, that worked really well. Mm -hmm. So how do you do water? Um, that's been, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the, the biggest challenge. Um, most of our pastures have uh, pipelines to it, at least one water source. Um, some of them are, are just stock dams and we're trying to, trying to get water infrastructure there, especially this year, it's so dry. Um, really, if you don't have pipeline to the pasture this year, you don't have pasture because the water is either not there or it's uh, the total dissolved solids of it is too high. Um, so we have like one well here on the home place that feeds, we got a, uh, about three miles of pipeline coming off that and um, feeds goes to three different, three different sections. And then on two other sections, we have uh, rural water, like a rural water pipeline uh, company that supplies those two pastures. And then uh, some property that we just, just purchased has been a real challenge. Uh, there's just one well on two sections and it's only putting out four to five gallons a minute. And, uh, and with it being so hot day after day with it 95, 100 degrees, we've, we've been having to haul some water to supplement them. But so we're gonna have to address that uh, this winter so we don't have to you know, keep, keep burning fuel and wear and tearing equipment to get water to them. But we're making it work and we're, uh, we're grazing over there. So right. that land hasn't had animal impact on it and I don't, I don't need, I don't know how long, it, but uh, it, the soil over there is just, just kind of dead. And uh, so it needs, it needs to have cattle on it. Even if we have to haul some water over there, it's going to be a, a win in the long run. I think. So when you do water, when you, you know, provide water for the cows, a couple of questions. One is how do you keep from making it too labor intensive? Uh, and, and how do you keep the cattle from trampling too much in any one area, or is that a problem? Oh, you mean like around water? Right. Um, so we have, this year we bought these portable water tanks. They're steel water tanks, they're 1400 gallons. Uh, we can move them around with our bale bed on our pickup. Um, so we've been trying to move them about every, we kind of let cows trail back a quarter to a half mile from the water. So uh, when we come into a pasture, we'll set up our paddock around the water. Uh, it'll be, depending on what kind of workload we have, I'd like to move daily. But if we got stuff going on where we uh, might be gone for a couple days, I might put two, three days worth. But anyway, uh, set up the first paddock around the water and then I'll just uh, open up a, another paddock like away from the water um, the next day and the next day and the next day. And uh, they don't really, that first paddock around the water and then the subsequent paddocks away that you have them grazing, there's such animal impact on that and manure and urine uh, down on it that they really don't want anything to do with that anymore. And we graze away. Um, what you, you wanna protect is the regrowth that's gonna come in, come in behind that. And what I've found, especially here when it's, when it's a drier climate, we really don't get regrowth until two weeks. We don't start seeing green shoots. So, um, that original paddock that I have the water in, as long as I have the cows out of that paddock in 14 days and onto some place new, I'll get full, you know, utilization of recovery of, of that initial paddock. And um, I know, and if, so, if someone's like wanting to get into this and they think, well, that's that's unreasonable for them, but it's not. Uh, you don't you don't have to do that. Like wherever you're at, I mean, even busting a pasture in half, you have a hundred acre pasture and you bust it in half with a poly wire. 
you graze one side, move it to the move them to the other and lock them out of that other side. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've already doubled your recovery time on that half. So like where where I'm at doing that, it, it's not that complicated. You don't have to go from zero to to daily moves. There's a lot of a lot of wiggle room in between. So uh, have do you, how do you do the electric fencing? Is it the same as you did when you started or have you changed it a little bit? The, the technology and also your, uh, you know, whatever methods you use to move the fences, that kind of thing. Yeah, it's kind of been a, a real learning experience. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of a trial by error guy. I probably should have went and spent time on, uh, on other people's places a lot more. But uh, just watching uh, Greg Judy videos and stuff, I kind of had an idea. Uh, my first summer doing it, so this is my third summer, so I'm not acting like I know a whole lot, but mm -hmm. uh, just from what I've learned so far. My first summer, I like yeah, around every water source, I kind of tried to go in a pie and, uh, and then back fence off the, the pies that they'd already been in. And that, that was real labor intensive. And I'd have so much poly wire out there, I couldn't get a good good charge on anything so that wasn't any good so uh watching uh listening to some jim jim garish presentations and how he talks about strip grazing so last year i went mostly towards strip strip grazing there are instances where you know pie shape or however the pasture shape might work better but i'd say about 80 90 percent of the time i'm strip grazing away from water and so um my i use uh, gallagher turbo wire poly wire and then um, I've tried going with some cheaper poly braid stuff because you can get it for like half the price, but it just falls apart in, in a year and it can't, can't really do the wear and tear. Um, and then uh, I really had good luck with uh, the speed right fencers that you can just like set on top of the T-posts. Uh, I forget what number it is, but it puts out what 9,000 9, volts. And uh, I had a few cheap fencers that first year and that put out like only like 4,500 volts. Uh, that extra, you know, double the price fencer that puts out nine, 10,000 volts, that makes all the difference in the world. Because mm -hmm. uh, those cows, especially when they're uh, you late in the summer when it's dry right now and there's a, a alfalfa field right on the other side of that wire, they'll, they'll go through that 4,000 volts. <laughs> But they don't like that nine thousand. They uh, they they'll go through a barbed wire fence before they mm -hmm. go through that that little poly wire. It's kind of mm -hmm. kind of kind of amazing. So uh, yeah, so yeah, those speed right chargers and the the Gallagher turbo wire Gallagher step in posts um, have been what I've I'm using. And now on that uh, on that property that we're uh, we just got, we're putting up uh, um, twelve gauge high tensile wire. We're just doing single strand right now, seeing how it works. We might have to go to two strand, one hot, one ground, uh, but we haven't had any trouble with it yet. So uh, knock on wood. Uh, uh, tell me about your cows. Um, so we, we have a long ways to go where we want to be because I was in that conventional model just a few years ago and uh, I didn't sell the whole herd. I'm just kind of working with what I got and Try it. So we have about, uh, we have uh, our cows are across of uh, Angus, Hereford, and Simital. Um, they're probably about average about 14, 1500 pounds. So they're, they're plenty big. Most of them are black. Um, but we're going to, we, we want to try to get our cow size down to that 11, 1200 pound range at least. Run a few more cows, a little bit smaller calves. And uh, I think. Um, our, our biggest cost up here in North Dakota is our winter feed costs. And those bigger cows cost a lot more to feed, uh, harder to keep condition on them. And uh, I want to, from my conventional before, I was, uh, you know, feeding for six, seven months in the winter. Uh, now I'm going to try to to graze for at least two or three months, if it's open, hopefully longer uh, during the winter. So a uh, smaller frame cow is going to be easier to maintain. And I expect when I start winter grazing, I'm going to get rid of a lot of those uh, older, bigger cows pretty quick. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to fall out. So. Right. So you don't, uh, my understanding, you don't treat for parasites or anything like that, or any, you don't give antibiotics. So what would you tell somebody that, uh, you know, if you're trying to win them over to your way of doing things, 
uh, why, why not give the, the parasite treatments or the antibiotics and that kind of thing? What do, what do farmers usually do under the conventional method and why do you do it differently? I would say, so if you, uh, I can't remember who said this, if you do what you always do, you're always gonna have what, what you always had. Mm -hmm. So if you're vaccinating whatever for something, uh, whatever you're vaccinating your cattle for, as soon as you stop vaccinating them for that, they're going to be at risk for that because they have no, no immunity built up to it in their, mm. in, in their bloodline. That specific animal will have immunity to it, but the, the herd as a, as a whole will not. And the same thing goes for ivermectin and porons. Um, I've, this summer or this winter, um, I, I got so uh, frustrated with the bulls that I that I've been purchasing, um, because, you know, everyone has their bull sales in the winter. They got to have their bulls looking perfect. Heaven forbid they got a little bit of lice on them and a little bit of rub spot, so they just pour pour the shit out of ivermectin on them, and uh, so I don't pour. So I get them, and they are all rubbed bare in January, and it is negative twenty. And I go look at my cows that I haven't been pouring for, for four or five years now. And, you know, there's a couple ones that, ha that, you know, have some rough spots on them, but for the most part, everything looks, looks all right. And uh, yeah. And so I, I got pretty, pretty set up with, with the ivermectin because we, if you pour, you're always going to have to pour every year, just like, just yeah. like the vaccine. Right. You're, you're never going to, your cattle are never going to develop a resistance to lice, never going to develop a resistance to flies. And it's never the whole herd that has lice. It's just the really crappy looking ones, or it's only the really crappy looking ones that have flies. And then those ones give lice and flies to the rest of your herd. So if you just, if you just stop and you let the ones that don't have the resistance to them, they, they're not going to breed back. They're not, you know, they're going to raise a smaller calf and look like crap in the fall. And you can call them out, and then over the years, you're going to develop up a, a natural resistance through your herd through all those all those things. Right. The one thing I've heard is that, um, you know, the I'm not sure what all the terminology is, but you know, the the ivermectin uh, it, it like harms the insect populations. You know, so. You know, yeah, one that's, principle. That's, go ahead. Yeah, that's another thing too. Uh, I guess I didn't. I didn't go down the. I was more making appeal to uh, maybe a conventional rancher there. Yeah, might be a good idea. But for us on the regenerative side, yeah, that's that's a huge thing. I uh, I don't want to kill my dung beetles anymore. Uh, last mm -hmm. year was the first year we finally saw some dung beetles. I'd never seen them before in my in my life, and um, we just saw some burrowers, some some little ones, and and, uh, and a couple tunnelers. This year, haven't seen as many because I guess they don't do very well in drought. So that's kind of frustrating not seeing them this year. But uh, that, uh, yeah, you don't just kill the flies and you don't just kill the lice. Um, I know there's some people, or uh, I won't name the company, but there's there's a company that that has a pour on me like, oh, it only kills the flies. It just just targets the flies, and. That, that is impossible to know. <laughs> you, you, like, right. You, you dump that on like the, the billions of insects. You try that on every single insect. Nope, it doesn't kill that one. doesn't kill that one. Like, and, uh, you know, even if it doesn't kill an insect, just like if, if I were to dump like a two and a half gallon jug of Roundup on top of you, it's not going to kill you, but who knows what effect it is, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have any long term. And yeah, so in, in, insects are the same way. You know, it, it could, prevent them from breeding it could it could do a number of things that we just don't know about i know so what what's the uh like let's say a person a rancher is concerned only about profitability what is it uh how does it help your profit or does it how does it help your profits to i don't know yeah maybe to do without ivermectin or how does it help your profits to have dung beetles? I mean, does that do anything to your, uh, to your ground, to your grazing land that is, is positive from the standpoint of profitability? Yeah, so just, I guess the infrastructure you need to, to pour ivermectin, whether it's, you know, getting them, getting cows into a corral or running them through a chute, or, I mean, you gotta, you gotta, 
your time and money. I mean, you're going to have to spend a whole day doing that. And then if you have multiple herds, how much time and let alone, you know, also the cost of it, but the cost is minimal, I think for the product, but it, but it's your labor and wear and tear yeah. on your equipment on everything. And then as far as the, the dung beetles, the dung beetles, um, you know, it, it, it kind of, uh, just like the lice thing where it perpetuates itself, the fly thing. So the uh, ivermectin kills the flies, but the flies are the first thing that are able to survive in it. And then uh, the dung beetles, if, if they were there, would be going through man the manure, eating the fly larva, uh, burrowing holes in it so it can get air, air into it. And once the manure pack kind of dries out, the fly larva has a tough time, uh, tough time surviving. So you have less flies that way. And also the dung beetles, you know, once my soils get healthier and um, I'm able to get some, you know, tunneler, some more tunnelers and some rollers and stuff, those dung beetles are actually taking that manure, uh, burrowing holes in the ground and, and putting it below ground that increases water infiltration and then obviously mm. fertility and just a lot of different benefits. Right. So, you know, over the course of time, I mean, you want to have living soils, not dead. So something that was, you know, and the previous generation, the generation, but starting in 1950, there's, there was just, uh, you know, in mainstream agriculture, there was just, um, there was just no conversation about the importance of having living soils. But what we know is that it takes living soils to, do, to deliver nutrition to the plant uh, so that the plant can be healthy and hardy and resilient. And we know that it takes living soils to like infiltrate water. You're going to have much better infiltration rates. And especially if you're in a place wh wherever you are, whether you're, in, I'm, I'm in Kentucky, so we have a relatively wet climate, but wherever you are, better infiltration rates are going to like extend your green growth, your, your period of green growth, uh, better infiltration rates are just make you drought proof. Uh, better infiltration rates are going to help you have more of a diversity of plant matter. Uh, that diversity of plant matter is going to exude carbon out of its roots and is going to build your soil carbon. Soil carbon, by definition, is going to help your, your water absorption. There's a ratio like one to eight. Every gram of soil carbon increases your, uh, your water retention by, uh, by eight for every, grams. For yeah, every... so. I could have, I could have, but it's somewhere around this. For every one percent of soil organic matter you gain per acre, uh, that acre can hold twelve thousand gallons of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and who who doesn't want that? Yeah, you know, I was yeah. uh, listening to Gabe by audio book today, and you know he says something that he's said many times, which is, you know, and I, I made somebody mad the other day. The other day by you no know, one person, I, I I posted something to the effect that you know. I was, going on what Gabe said, it's, uh, you know, it's not how much rain you get, it's how much you keep. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, you know, people are struggling with drought uh, now. And, you know, some people just don't want to hear that. And, and that's, that's fine. I understand the, uh, the, the anguish that goes along with that. But in the long run, it really is true that, you know, if you have, uh, I mean, Gabe has increased his, um, his infiltrate, it used to take a, a half inch of water an hour to yes. soak in now it's like an inch and a minute and another in, another in, or i don't know just crazy yeah. rates now okay he got a foot of rain in a day all of it soaked in uh that's just that we gotta understand for so many reasons we have to understand how valuable that is not least of all from the standpoint of profitability yeah yeah it's uh it, it's it's pretty amazing um just like so, so comparing like my land to this new stuff that 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 we got um some of the fields were conventionally tilled for 50 60 years and then when all the topsoil was gone they seeded it into hay ground and there's just no organic matter or any um any sort of uh aggregation in the soil and so like I'm hauling water over there and when I spill water on the ground, um, it, it does, it just, it just runs and sits mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. and the ground will be powdery, like where the cows stomped it up. So you'd think mm -hmm. it'd go in the, in the dirt, but it just sits on top. Yeah. 
and you can step in it when you step in it it like your your foot just turns into a mud clod and it, it just acts totally different than mm -hmm. the than the soil just a couple miles away and my my soils here aren't that healthy either but it's just they they haven't also haven't been tilled in 30 40 years or <laughs> not, not 30 uh, 20 years yeah uh, but uh but soil that was just repeatedly beat down and tilled up until last year just how different it, it acts and feels and it's uh yeah that that water just just can't even can't even infiltrate it just sits there on top or 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 it just runs on top it just has no chance of going in the ground yeah i've heard it said that you know when rain falls it can go two three or four different directions it can go down it can go up or it can go sideways and we have way too much rain going sideways you know if, if it goes sideways for one thing it's not yours anymore for another thing when it goes sideways it, it's often taking erosion with it or it's taking nitrates with it that kind of thing yeah so uh, let's just touch upon a minute the the five principles of soil health i, I probably can remember three or four of them at a time but uh one of them is <clears throat> keep living roots in the ground well, one is uh, for number one avoid disturbance so you're going to avoid tillage and you're going to avoid chemical disturbance another thing is keep your ground covered like even if it's like bare ground with nothing living you're going to have something or some organic matter on top of it if possible another thing is keep living roots in the ground you know living roots in the ground there I, i've heard that i need to verify this but i i heard it somewhere and i, I believe it that at any given time we're just talking about cropland at any given time worldwide the, about half of the cropland is bare because you grow a crop and then you don't do a cover crop, let alone a diverse cover crop, you know, no cover crops at all. So that ground is bare. That's ground that doesn't have living roots in it. It's not, you know, those living roots are not putting carbon in the soil. If you were putting carbon in the soil, it helps your infiltration rates. It helps, uh, you know, over the course of time, you just, uh, you know, it takes an eco, it takes an ecosystem to grow a plant. And I, I heard uh, John Kempf say that, like the soil is to the plant as the rumen is to the cow. So the rumen is the place where the digestion happens. Living soil is the place where the plant digestion happens. So any nutrition that that plant is going to get is going to come from that living soil that has the community of organisms, the bacteria, the fungi, the worms, the insects, the dung beetles, that community of organisms are making that soil healthy. So it's like you, know, you grow the soil and the soil grows the plants. And that counts no matter what your goals are, no matter who you are. If you're, uh, you know, if you're talking about livestock, if you're talking about crops, if you're talking about, you know, habitat for wildlife, if you, if you just want a place that's ecologically healthy, no matter what your goals are, you, you got to be growing that healthy soil. Yeah, yep, exactly. I 100% agree. <laughs> so uh, wh what else, uh, what else can we talk about? We've been on 33 minutes as the, uh, the tell me, like, go back to when you were a kid, what was it like growing up on the ranch? And then how did your parents do things? And, and, and tell me about that. Yeah, so yeah, growing up, uh, we had uh, that was pretty conventional. I think he didn't use any chemicals in the field. I think if he wanted to, he probably could have been organic. Probably just didn't want to do the paperwork. But uh, yeah, uh, full tillage um, started out like I remember doing quite a bit of summer follow. Uh, uh, that you know, that's where uh, after a crop, till the land, and then the next summer you don't grow a crop on, on half the fields. You just till them because it's supposed to collect rainfall for the following crop. Um, I, well, what do you think? Is that, is that accurate? <laughs> uh, and no, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, uh, no, we know better, don't we? <laughs> yeah, there is, you know, uh, there is studies that it does, like it, your subsoil does retain a little bit more moisture, but uh, the amount of you know, once you land use costs and machinery costs, and everything, but it, it's just doesn't even come close to penciling out, but there's driving through uh, uh, the country. Uh, uh, I do a little bit of uh, hotshot trucking 
on the side and I, I drive down uh, to Oklahoma and Texas quite a bit and through Eastern Colorado and Nebraska Panhandle, Western Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas Panhandle. It is unbelievable how many people still do uh, do summer follow. Uh, here in Western North Dakota, it's not very common anymore. Pretty much everyone has gone to minimal till or, or no till, but it's still, you know, it's still conventional. Everything is just done with, you know, Roundup and, and uh, but it, it, at least it, it's a step in the right direction, I think, but it is unbelievable once you get, you get south of here, how much uh, uh, summer fall there still is. But yeah, anyway, so there was a little bit of that growing up and uh, we kind of went away from that. And my dad didn't fertilize, I remember fertilizing when we were young, but I think the fertilizer got out of hand. And so we just quit fertilizing too. But also then the yields went down and I don't think it was real profitable. Uh, you know, we weren't, my dad had to work off, got, had like a side job doing water pipelines in the summer. My mom was a school teacher. So two kind of off farm jobs to, to keep things going. And it was always, it was always fairly stressful. I mean, it was a good way to be raised. And, um, but uh, yeah, and then on, on the, on the cattle side, we always had between like 75 and hundred cattle. Um, yeah, can, can fairly conventional, did a little bit of pasture rotation, but like I said earlier, we have, we have smaller pastures. So rather than having like 10 herds, we just had two or three and then rotated those around a little bit. But, um, so yeah, that's, that, that's kind of that. And then I remember, you know, putting out, uh, you know, this time of year, late in the summer, uh, going and hang, hanging, uh, like, uh, uh, the insecticide bags on, on these overhangs that the cows could walk underneath and <laughs> kill, kill all the flies. And uh, I remember, yeah, I remember doing that and how my dad would put on these big rubber gloves to handle that stuff. And uh, yeah, now looking back, that stuff's probably not the, what you want on, on the beef you're eating. So. Uh, right, exactly. I mean, so, you know, given the fact that it's not the most rational thing to do from all standpoints, you know, all the inputs uh, across the board, you know, you, you start, you know, you go regenerative and you start doing without a lot of the inputs, including the toxic things that you do to cattle. Uh, what is it that keeps those practices in place? I like the regenerative, uh, the, the drive to like keep doing it regeneratively. No, it's like oh, if people, keep, people keep doing conventionally, conventionally, you know, spending yeah. money on the inputs, inputs are toxic. It doesn't make all the sense in the world. It might for to some people, but it seems like there's a lot of the, it seems like there are a lot of people that could change and go to more of a regenerative model and they'd be happy if they did, but they don't. So why is yeah. that? I would say a big factor of it is uh, social dynamics, uh, whether it's, I think probably most of them are going to be family dynamics um, with someone you know, dad's at home or grandpa's at home. And this is the way we've always done it. We've made this work for 70 years and maybe junior wants to, you know, they're sending him to these conferences and stuff and he's been reading and he wants to try new things and, you know, they're calling him crazy. And, you know, that, you know, really beats someone down and, you know, how much can they really push against, you know, someone that kind of owns everything uh, I think that that's one big thing. Another is fear of what people think. Um, you know, it's really easy to bra brag about uh, weaning weights in the conventional model, like, you know, having big calves, especially up here. Um, no one really brags about like a 475 pound group of steers. <laughs> so, uh, that uh, I, th I think that that's a big, that's a big thing. It's just doing things a little bit differently. Like I, I get frustrated a lot just because it's so clear to me, like mm. what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And it's frustrating sometimes when I'm talking to people and tell, telling that they're asking me about what I do and I'm, I'm trying to explain to them and, and you can just tell they just don't get it. And they're just like, this guy is crazy. Let's just get him to quit talking. And uh, it, it uh, I think a lot of people would get turned off by that. But uh, I'm lucky to, I, I've been so surprised, like just, you know, being early into this, um, 
you know, like I, I found this through like watching Gabe Brown videos and um, I called Gabe Brown and Gabe, like Gabe, I met Gabe Brown, and, uh, went out there and I mean, he gave me over, like over an hour of his time for, you know, didn't have any motivation, gave me a free copy of his book and, um, and just like through Soil for Climate or uh, the Regenerative Grazing Group or everything cover crops, there's uh, everybody, or, you know, not everybody, but like 95% of the people like uh, that are part of this community just want to share and like are excited when someone else wants to to learn and and and, and wants to join in so uh, it's been it's been awesome just how welcoming like the whole the whole regenerative community is and you know we may be spread out you know not next door neighbors but you know especially it's been helpful finding you know, I have three, four people that are kind of in the same similar climate that I have, I'm in, and we have similar challenges. And it's just, it's a lot of, it's it's nice to talk to them and kind of, you know, share experiences, and especially if they've been doing this for a lot longer than I have, because they've probably been through a drought before, bad drought before, you know, had had different challenges or had the same kind of growing pain. So that's been that's been pretty cool. Right. It seems like the regenerative crowd. Um... You know, I've heard that there's just kind of more of a sense of community, more of a sense of common mission and purpose and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think we're all, you know, I don't know what, what everyone believes, but it doesn't really matter. We're all working. I, I like, I feel a deep sense of purpose, like working uh, to make like even our little corner of the county better. Maybe our little corner of the county can uh, uh, main, hold more rainfall and and maybe we can have a little micro start creating just a little bit of microclimate and things start looking a little bit better around here and then pe pe then it then it spreads so yeah. i think we all kind of feel a deeper sense of sense of purpose with it right absolutely so don't you hate it when you lose your train of thought <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah well you, you mentioned the microclimate that's a big that's something i think about all all the time or at least you know okay i know what else i was going to say but one thing that that should be a selling point for regenerative agriculture is that if enough people do it or if you enough have enough land of your own it can it can generate maybe more rainfall and even if you don't get more annual precipitation it it, it, it can be a kind of a cooler environment your plants are more resilient that kind of thing yeah and you can i mean you can look at just at the city of bismarck and gabe gabe has talked about this a lot like uh you know like a city it's you know black black asphalt uh concrete and that reflects sunlight there's there's you know there's some some trees in neighborhoods but the majority it kind of creates a little heat bubble uh much like a tilled field would and they're on the east side of Bismarck, and there is a lot of times when there's thunderstorms coming towards Bismarck, and it hits that heat bubble that's coming off all the asphalt. I know. And it, it, it'll dissipate it, or yeah, it, 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 it'll it'll push it away. And you can also see it, like especially, you can really notice it out here in drier areas, where there's one area that'll get a, just a good pop up thunderstorm, and they'll and they'll continue to get hit time and time and time again because that area has, and it might just be a 20, 15, 20 square mile area, because that area has so much more humidity and so much more water out of it, like in, in the soil that can feed those clouds. And it's just a cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so it's, yeah, it, it, it's really apparent in those type of situations. I, I, I'm, I'm learning kind of the different factors in, in rainfall and, and, and like there's three or four main ones and you know one of the main one is how much you know because of your plant matter and because of your healthy soil that's going to generate more uh you know more water vapor to eventually come back down another thing that you hinted at is the uh you know the heat bubble also known as a heat dome also known as a, a heat island effect uh that you know that heat bubble like if it's a city or possibly if it's a you know, a, a bare ground or a desert floor, but even if it's just bare ground or especially if it's a city, you know, that is hot, dry air. Rain comes from 
comes from moist, humid air that is by definition low pressure. So that low pressure air is going over this heat dome. It physically impossible mm -hmm. for that low pressure air to penetrate into that heat if the heat dome is strong enough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a city, there's maybe only so much we can do about that. But in rural areas and agricultural areas, we have so much control over how much rain we get. Another thing that we need to know is that, um, you know, it's like, why should farmers care about forests? I'd be interested in your take on this. But one thing I know about forests is that if you have enough trees, trees tend to emit this bacteria called the aerobacter. And it, it you know, about half the rain, rain requires a nucleus. So the nucleus can be salts or it can be, there, there's three, there's, there's three I can remember too, but salts on the ocean can form that you have million, you need millions of raindrops to come together, or you need millions of water uh, molecules to come together to form one raindrop. And the thing that does the best job of that, if you're on land, is the, this aerobacter bacteria that comes from the trees. So, it, and that causes the precipitation. Also, you know, forests tend to pull uh, air to them. This is kind of a novel theory, but I think it has merit. It's not really accepted by the mainstream climatology, but you know, we know that forests get more rain. Mainstream climatology thinks that's because of a temperature differential, but some uh, some people think it's because of a of a of a uh, of a pressure. I, I, I forget what. But anyway, I, I do know that. Forests pull rain to them. Forests attract rain. The wind that forests create a wind that brings rain to them, and we're just we're just crazy for all this deforestation. And it, it it's a short term profit for a not nothing against anybody that needs to do some logging, but it's a you know, it tends to be a short term gain for a few people. Whereas you know the more dense a forest is, the more it's going to, you know, hold moisture so it can contribute that to the air, but it's also going to, you know, it's, it's going to pull, uh, pull wind to it, pull rain to it, and that bacteria then causes the precipitation. Uh, we used to think, you know, if you go back in, in school, like if you think of the water cycle in school, what they show is here is it evaporates from a body of water. Mm -hmm. and then it goes to the land and then it becomes rain well that's what happens if you're near the coast but if you're any if you're inland to any extent it's true it's plant matter mainly trees that are causing that rain and mm -hmm. so anyway in, so, in what, end of rant but we just need to you well, know that, we, that that's interesting so what uh like what would like so what's your take on uh i guess forest management um like obviously you know clear cutting is bad what's your view on like logging if it's like selective cutting um and, and that so kind of opens up the canopy and you know all those buzzwords <laughs> yeah well the best uh source the source that i rely on for this is a guy named chad t hansen um he's a, a he's a for what it's worth, he's a, a lawyer and a PhD. He's a, on the board of the National Sierra Club, um, and which is not always, <laughs> not always, you know, the type of anyway. Uh, but he's really articulate, and he he does a really good talk. He's written a book called Smokescreen: Debunking the Myths, uh, and he he says a couple of things about the selective logging. He says a couple of things. One is that if if you do the selective logging, uh, I mean, the, what they call it is fuel reduction. But uh, so the idea is that if there's less fuel then that's gonna cause less of the high intensity fires. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but he points out a couple of things. One is if, there's, if the forest is more dense, then it's gonna hold more moisture. And if it's more undisturbed, if it's more old growth, then it's gonna hold more moisture. 
And therefore, for one thing, that's going to contribute to rain. For another thing, it's going to, it's going to slow the progress of a wildfire. Another thing he says is that when a wildfire is going on, then the fire tends to pull in air to the fire. And it helps to not have thinned out the forest because those extra trees are a windbreak and it's going to slow down the, the so so there's the the logging has there are a couple of different things like like why are you asking the question and one thing would be are we trying to prevent forest fires especially high intensity forest fires another thing is what other function does the purpose does the forest serve another question is you know, how much from the standpoint, like, like the logging company, whoever owns it, whoever owns that forest is going to want to log because that's how they make their money. But then there's the public interest involved. There's how much is that forest contributing to the surrounding ecology? Uh, you know, forest is a shelter for bees and butterflies and birds, uh, I mean, trees, a dead tree is more ecologically valuable than the tree was when it was living because it's going to, for one thing, it's going to absorb water and that's good. It, that, that it's going to be a source of water for bees and butterflies and insects. And a, a, a lot of animals, a lot of insects make their living off of causing that dead tree to decay. And then things like woodpeckers come in and they get their meal from that. So, 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 the, so there's that, there's a lot of public interest in an intact forest. And another thing that Hansen points out is that uh, he, he, he cites a survey that they say, okay, logging brings jobs. But there's, he said, if you, there was a county by county survey done, I think in California, employment is higher in places where you have an intact forest. Because for one thing, nobody goes camping on the clear, you know, it, 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 it does things for the economy. In, in ways that kind of too much logging is bad for the economy. Uh, you know, so, so there's that. What do you think, uh, so like we've interrupted like the natural fire, um, the natural fire occurrence in, in the forest because we have fire mitigation when historically the fires would you know, have to burn themselves out. And a lot of times bad old growth in the forest, like you said, that stuff doesn't burn but it does clear out some of the, the younger, younger stuff. And some of these forests haven't seen fire. So they do get so choked with like these young littler saplings and, and uh, stuff like that. So what do you have any opinion on that? I really don't see the downside of that. Okay. I mean, if, if there are, if the, you know, the only exception I can think of is if there are a lot of invasive species, somehow that's not the, but, you know, so the question is, you know, there are different, uh, there, there's not a one size fits, for one thing, there's not a one size fits all. Or, yeah, there, every type of biome, every type of like, you know, mix of plants has a, a different natural relationship with fire. So that's one thing. And uh, another thing is we don't want to, there are plants that are fire dependent and there are others that are animal dependent. If it's, if it's either going to get burned or it's going to get eaten. So there are whole species like Australia tends to be a place where there's lots of, of because the Aborigines uh, burned a lot and, and it tends to be uh, it tends to be fire dependent species, but it's good to move back. And a lot, some of Africa is fire dependent because, you know, been, because partly because you do the controlled burns, but you want to, in most cases, you want to move back to where you have more animal dependent plant species. Because for one thing, uh, that, that's going to be good for water. Like it, it's going to be it, you know, the fire dependent stuff wants to burn. Eucalyptus wants to burn, but we don't want, you know, that we, we want more of the animal dependent that can tolerate fires. And it's good for fires to be done naturally, I feel. I mean, I, I, you know, a few years ago, I learned about controlled burns. Oh, that seems to be a good idea sometimes. But I, I really, I, I'm not sure, I can't think of a, one thing Hansen says about controlled burns is that it's, it's usually out of sync with that ecosystem. 
you know, maybe it's the wrong time of year, or what have you. I think so. So Hanson's, you know, for what it's worth, his thought and his theory is that what's good is to, you know, let lightning cause the fire, and then and then let it burn, and that's the best thing, mm -hmm. rather than, uh, you know, and then. You take the resources that we put into trying to put fires out and put that into let's protect, you know, let's create a barrier and a buffer around where people live. If we took the resources that we spend on firefighting and put that into just protecting people's homes, be a much better use of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, one reason, one reason fires burn so hot is because we've been doing this thinning. Another reason fires burn hot is that, you know, I think evergreens tend to burn quicker. And, you know, if, if, if this is naturally this type of evergreen, then fine. But if it's an evergreen that is not native to that area, it could be like in Israel, they've been planting, you know, they've been planting and planting and planting these European pine trees and it's kindling there. So when there is a fire, it tends to. Mm -hmm. So anyway, a lot of different scattered thoughts. Um, no, those are, those are some of my thoughts. That's interesting. I think one simple thing we can do uh, to, and this this would help us on the plains too, is bring back the beaver. Oh, because, oh yes, talk it, talk about that. So, like. I was uh, I was working in this area this other week. It's kind of back. Back, back in the Badlands, back, there's a lot of hardwood draws. And uh, there is beaver dams all along the, this creek. Just, and it's the only creek, I've, one of the only creeks this year I've seen with water around here because it's so dry. And every one of those pools, you know, has beavers. And I've, I've been preaching this for a couple of years now, but um, one of the main problems is every one of our little creeks all throughout the nation used to be dammed up by beavers used to just be a subsequent series of little little ponds. And um, I think uh, Dr. Dwayne Beck said this, and I, and I could be misquoting him, but uh, paraphrasing that the amount of water that was held in all the, the beaver dams um, at the beginning of the 1800s could have filled up uh, all the Great Lakes or one of the Great Lakes, but anyway, a whole bunch of water. And yeah, the figure I've heard on that is at least one one place I've heard that, like I heard this from Joel South, and he said that you know there used to be like eight percent, the surface area by like by geographic size used to be eight percent fresh water because of beavers. Yeah, and um, yeah, what what that would do, and especially in the forest, and that's down to one percent. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, but uh, especially in like the forest environment. And uh, you know, this time of year, it's so hot and dry and all those creeks are, are bare, you know, there's no water in them. But what if they still had beavers in them? And, and those, those dry creek beds had little pools and they were riparian, green riparian areas and how many natural fire breaks that, that, that creates. Every, mm. every creek is a, is a fire break. And I, I, I don't know, there, there's not, you don't really he hear that much, but I think that would be a really simple solution is, and, and, and my neighbors around here, I got a, a neighbor that, that every time I talk to him, he's like, oh, you see any beavers around? The only good beaver is a dead beaver. That's his, <laughs> famous, that's his famous saying, because his thinking is it takes like 40 years to grow a tree. It takes a beaver like one afternoon to cut it down. But in, yeah, in a, in a, in a small aspect, yeah, that's true. But that beaver is damming up the water, and and, and a whole a whole bunch more trees are going to sprout from around that beaver dam, and it's going to supply water to a whole bunch of saplings. And eventually, that beaver dam is going to wash out, and you're going to have an established stand of trees. So, I don't know. Yeah. It's, well, uh, I, I'm you're preaching the choir. I, I really, I really think, yeah. You know, so, my this group is water and climate. What as of a few months ago, water became my thing, baby. I, I'm obsessed with it. And, and we, you know, we really need to take care of our water in terms of climate alone. Water needs to be a major focus of that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, so I say, you know, what do we need? What do we need for 
to well the goal like i don't know if you ever heard pa yeomans the australian he wrote a book called water for every farm and then mark shepherd in wisconsin kind of did a spinoff of that water for any farm but the goal is to have all of the rain that falls, it stays on your property. And uh, we, so what are the strategies for that? One of them is plant matter. One of them is healthy soil. One of them is what you call like, I might call earthworks, like things like swales and small dams. Now, you, know, you don't wanna dam a big river or a medium sized stream, but small dams. If you don't have beavers, act like a beaver and make a make a dam on that small a leaky dam that's going to break at some point make it on that small stream and and, and retain that water and it's so important so i, I heard that uh, you know in 1830 uh, you know, California, all of North America had a lot of beavers. 1830, California still had a lot of beavers. All of a sudden, it's like there was a, a big, we hear about the 1949 gold rush, but before that, there was a rush for the pelts. And around 1830 or so, killed all the beavers, sold the pelts, and now California doesn't have beavers. And you know, California hasn't always been as dry as it is. And what they're doing is they're, they're mining the the, the fossil water, they're you know, you're bringing up water out from underground when really wherever we are, what we need to do is, you know, we need to be getting our irrigation. If we irrigate, we need to be getting it from smaller ponds of rainwater. And I heard John Kemp say, uh, to listen to him, uh, that like it, just in his particular example, he says, I could spend four thousand dollars on a well that's going to pull water up out of the ground or i can spend sixty thousand dollars building these two ponds and i know that if i spend sixty thousand dollars building these two ponds i'm going to be able to grow a million dollar crop instead of an eight hundred thousand dollar crop you know that kind of thing so he has the math worked out in his mind and in any event we can only you know, we can only mine water for so long and then it's going to be gone. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to get water from rainfall. Yeah. And from yeah. ponds and that kind of thing. Plus, there's yeah, going to be a whole lot more of that. If we have plant matter that, you know, all the rain, the hydrological cycle, there's going to be a whole lot more water for us to harvest and use if we will be smart with our plant matter and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Out, out here in the West and you see people irrigating corn, you know, we only get 14 inches of rain or even even less some areas they're irrigating corn in a desert and it just doesn't you know when it's 100 degrees outside it, it it doesn't make a whole lot of sense i mean if you could be yeah plus that irrigation you know uh, there's an expense that goes along with it and the ir irrigation uh causes salinization you know so the the ground becomes more saline over the course of time. Sometimes they have to treat it because it's more saline. Plus, uh, you know, sometimes that turn. Sometimes it's like a. There's a. I think the, the roots get waterlogged, and you know, not to mention the expense. And you know, in the in the shorter term, you probably have to continue your irrigation for a little while. But the best to you know explore possibilities for weaning off of it. You know, healthy soil is going to absorb the rainfall. Healthy soil includes, uh, you know, mycorrhizal fungi. Those mycorrhizal fungi are a source of water for the plants. You know, so the the, the whole ecosystem, I think, is a is a storehouse of water in the yeah. underground ecosystem and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Trevor, I've taken up a, a good portion of your time. I really appreciate the time you've spent with me. Um, I wish you all the best on your farm. Let's uh, make sure and, and talk again soon. Uh, is there anything else that I should have asked you? No, no. I think we think we covered a good bit. I appreciate the time. It's been fun. Thanks so much. Now, stay on, and, and I'm going to end the recording, and then we'll talk for a little bit more. Sounds so good. I, I'm going to uh, try see if I can end the Facebook thing. Um, 
tell you, this is touch and go. I, I, I don't know what's <laughs> being recorded and I don't know. I think we're still on. Uh, uh, yeah, looks like we're still on Facebook, which is fine, but how do I end it? Um, I'm going to I'm going to click out. Uh, I don't want to get out of the Zoom call just yet. But let me see, edit video, transfer. OK, say uh, I saved video. And I don't want to transfer the video. Let me see. We're still on Facebook Live. Full screen. How is this done? Thanks, everybody. thanks the, for to who joined us. Art Hagen is live now on water and climate. I don't know how to edit, so this is all being recorded. <laughs> uh, delete, no, I don't want to delete, um, edit, unsave. I'll be darn. Let me see if I can, can get on the phone, Facebook, and, and end it. We'll see. Facebook. I'm going to go to groups. I'm going to go to water and climate group. And it says I'm live now. Hour and six minutes it's been going on. And so what if I do that? Edit, unsave. Hmm. How is this even done? Maybe I have to end the Zoom meeting. Zoom meeting. I'm going to end the Zoom meeting, Trevor. Yep. Sounds good.